All right. Well, this morning we have the privilege of hearing from Psalm 15. So if you would turn your Bibles to Psalm number 15. In this Psalm, we encounter a national anthem of, of sorts. In this national anthem, a song that was sung by an entire nation, this doesn't focus on the history of that nation. It doesn't seek to instill a sense of national pride in its people. This anthem isn't about the strength or the greatness of the nation's citizens. This national song is about the worship of God. This psalm is a song that seeks to encourage sincere, persevering worship of God in a group of people. And my hope and my prayer is that this song would have that same effect on us, that this psalm, Psalm 15, would make us, Grace Bible Church, more sincere, persevering worshipers of God. Let me read our text. A Psalm of David. O Yahweh, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? He who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. He does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear Yahweh. He swears to his own hurt and does not change. He does not put out his money at interest, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. Let's pray and ask God to bless the hearing of his word this morning. God, I pray that you would be with us as your word is preached, that we would look into the clarity of your word, God, and that we would be purified, that we would have our eyes enlightened as we look into your pure word. God, help me to be clear. Help our hearts to be ready to receive what you say is true. Where our hearts need to be encouraged, I pray you would strengthen us. Where our hearts need to be pricked, I pray you would convict, convict us. God, help us to listen attentively as we sit in the comfort of our own homes. And uh, God, let that not be a distraction to gleaning from the truth, the rich, deep well of truth that you have in this passage for us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. This national anthem, as I said before, promotes the praise of God. It promotes the praise of God so that those who sung it or read it or heard it read were encouraged to be sincere in their worship. What we encounter in this text is the promotion of sincere, persevering worship. That's the point of Psalm 15. Psalm 15 promotes sincere, persevering worship with three features. With three features, Psalm 15 promotes sincere, persevering worship. And the first feature that is intended to accomplish this in this psalm is number one, the questions acknowledging the uniqueness of Zion's citizens. The questions acknowledging the uniqueness of Zion's citizens. The questions asked in the opening lines of this psalm are of ultimate significance. Two lines easily passed over quickly, but make no doubt about it, these questions are of ultimate significance. The Psalm opens a Psalm of David, so we know who the author is. And then verse one gives us these questions. O Yahweh, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell? on your holy hill. Notice to whom the two questions are addressed. 
David writing this psalm addresses these two questions to Yahweh, Yahweh, the Lord in our English versions. Yahweh is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is Israel's God. He is the self-sufficient one who chose Abraham and his descendants after him to represent him and his name before the nations. This is the God who appeared to Moses in the burning bush, who appointed Moses as the rescuer of his people out of Egypt, and the one who eventually gave his law on Sinai, who descended in the cloud and stood with Moses there and proclaimed the name of Yahweh. He revealed himself in that moment to Moses saying, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. He is that kind of God, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and their children to the third and the fourth generations. That is this one. He is the one that we first encounter in the content of this song, the one whose worthiness and holiness are placed front and center in the text, in these opening questions that acknowledge the uniqueness of Zion's citizens. So the first question, let's take each of these one at a time. The first question, who may abide in your tent? Who may abide in your tent, Yahweh? This question is an inquiry into the kind of person who has God's approval for worship. The question is asking what kind of person is approved by God to worship him in the ways that God has designated in his tent. The tent referenced here is undoubtedly the tabernacle, which was constructed by Moses. Moses was given the pattern in Exodus 25 to 30. What took place in that tent, in that tabernacle is described in the book of Leviticus. And this was the centralized place of worship where God's very presence dwelled among his people. The Ark of the Covenant represented God's very presence. It was where God dwelled among his people. And yet this question is asked, Who has rightful access to that place? Who may abide in your tent? Who gets to go there and participate by approval of God in the practices God has ordained? Now, it's amazing that the psalm doesn't just end there, but that this question actually has an answer is incredible. The fact that anyone is welcomed by God has God's approval to be a participant, a worshiper in God's ordained system of worship is incredible. And so we shouldn't gloss over that. But the answer infers that it's a specific kind of person. Not everyone is approved by God to abide here. Not everyone has God approved access into this place? The first feature promoting sincere persevering worship is the uniqueness of Zion's citizens seen in the question and then answered in verses two to five, which we'll get to in a moment. The next question is is similar to the first, but includes some significant differences. Again, David asks, who, looking for a specific type of person, who may dwell on your holy hill? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Now, two different questions answered with the same answer, but the two questions have differences in them. Now what's not in view is just God's tent, but it's God's holy hill. The holy hill of Yahweh is in view. This hill or mountain, uh, same word in the Hebrew, is called Zion. 
this was the place on which the city of Jerusalem was built long before Israel even inhabited the land of Canaan. Uh, Zion was such a prominent geographical feature of this region that Jerusalem, the city, and Zion, the mountain on which Jerusalem sat, became synonymous, interchangeable terms for the same place, the same geographical place on the map. Zion and Jerusalem, the terms refer to the same location. And this place is described by David as holy. What made Zion holy was the fact that God who is holy, he was present there and also because this holy God who was present in Zion, in Jerusalem, also gave this place a unique, set apart, a special place in his plan for the world. We'll talk about why that's important to this psalm. There's one more interesting feature to note about these two questions, and that's the difference in the verbs that are used in each question. Look at the first line, O Yahweh, who may abide? There's your verb, your action word. Who may abide in your tent? And then David uses a different word in the second question saying, who may dwell on your holy hill? Now David, writing words inspired by the Holy Spirit is intentional in the language that that he's using. And the two words differ primarily in the sense of the duration of time that someone is staying in these places. So the word abide and dwell, two different words, both have to do with someone staying in a place, but the amount of time these two words throughout the scriptures, the Old Testament, indicate a temporal versus a permanent stay. And it's easy really to discern which word has a, a temporal aspect to it and which word has a more permanent abiding aspect to it. And the fact of where the abiding and where the dwelling is taking place. Do you see that in the first line? Who may abide where? In your tent. And then who may dwell where? On your holy mountain or hill. And so a, since tent is a temporary structure, especially the tabernacle, the tabernacle was intended to be a temporary, temporary place of worship. And David himself resolved to give God a more permanent dwelling place. So the tent being referenced is really temporary and doesn't even last much longer than the time after this psalm was written. So abide then is indicating a temporary sojourn, a temporary stay in the tent. And dwell is the word that takes on a more permanent sense because the mountain itself where the dwelling takes place is also more permanent than the tent. Do you understand? So abide, a temporary stay in the tent and dwell has a more permanent sense to it. Now, with these questions, David is acknowledging that there is a unique category then by asking who, he's acknowledging there's a unique category of people who can lay rightful claim to both God's temporary abode as well as God's permanent dwelling place in Zion. God's temporary abode in the tent and God's permanent dwelling place on Mount Zion or in Jerusalem. These people not only have the right temporarily to dwell in God's presence, but God has granted them the right to a permanent place with him as well, as permanent as Mount Zion, Yahweh's holy hill. But that sort of begs the question then, how permanent is Mount Zion? In God's mind, how permanent is this place? If Zion's true citizen has enduring rights to God's presence there, then how long does Zion endure? That's a fair question. 
We know that the tabernacle went away when Solomon built the temple. But when David indicates a permanency of dwelling on Zion, what's the extent of the duration he has in mind? And we're going to answer that question now. What's the extent when he's using the word dwell? What's the extent of the permanency that he's indicating there? How long do the rights to this place last for the true citizen of Zion? And answering that question is going to help accomplish what this psalm is intended to do, to promote sincere, persevering worship in us. So to answer that question, we need to know what David knows. And to find that out, we must go back to the Torah, to Moses's writings. So we're going to go back, flip in your Bible to the book of Genesis, chapter 12. We'll start here. And what I want to do is walk us back, back, back from Genesis all the way forward to understand what is in David's mind when he is writing as a prophet of God, as God's king at this point in redemptive history. What's he thinking about? He knows the law. He's well acquainted with the writings of Moses. He believes the writings of Moses and Joshua and Samuel and the other writers of scripture all the way up until he himself is writing the very Psalm that we're reading, Psalm 15. So when he is writing these things, what does David know that he is then importing into this Psalm? That's gonna help promote sincere, persevering worship in us even this morning in 2020, looking at this psalm on a Sunday. And so buckle up. We're going to work through several passages that are going to get us all the way back to Psalm 15. In Genesis 12, we begin with Abraham and God's call of the man Abram. We read in verse 1, Now Yahweh said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went forth as Yahweh had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions, which they had accumulated, and the persons which they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. This was the land to which God was bringing him. Verse six says, Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Moreh. Now the Canaanite was then in the land. Moses is giving commentary. Yahweh appeared to Abram and said this, to your descendants, I will give this land. Notice he left Ur of the Chaldeans. God brought him to a specific place that God said in verse one that he would show him. And when he gets there, God appears to him and tells him that he would give this land to Abram's descendants. So then it says Abram built an altar there to Yahweh who had appeared to him. God promised to give Abram's descendants this particular plot of land in what we call now the Middle East. So let's fast forward to chapter 17 and see how this progresses. 
Verse 1, now when Abram was 99 years old, Yahweh appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. That's significant. Verse 7, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Notice how God is distinguishing between Abraham and Abraham's descendants, between me and you and your descendants, between me and you and your descendants after you. And then in verse eight, he says this, key verse, I will give to you and to your descendants after you, what? The land of your Abraham sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession and I will be their God. So God promises something very specific to Abraham the man and to Abraham's descendants. We read it in verse eight. He is going to give to Abraham and to Abraham's descendants that come after Abraham, this specific land, all the land of Canaan, he calls it. God is promising to a specific man and that man's specific descendants, a land, a specific plot on the map, on the globe, planet earth. He is promising Abraham and Abraham's descendants, this land. Also significant to note as we work our way back to Psalm 15, that in Genesis 17 that we just read, verse one, what does God require of this man, Abraham, to whom he promises the land of Canaan? Verse one, he says, walk before me and be blameless. God who promised Abraham the land also required holiness of life from Abraham. That's significant. What about Isaac? What about Abraham's son? Did God's promises change at all from what he told to Abraham when it came to Isaac, his son? Fast forward to Genesis 26. This will answer this question for us. Now there was a famine in the land besides the previous famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham. So Isaac went to Gerar, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. Yahweh appeared to him, just like he did to Abraham. Yahweh appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and to your descendants, I will give all these lands and I will establish the oath which I swore to your father, Abraham. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and I will give your descendants all these lands. And by your descendants, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So the promise, the same promise given to Abraham was also repeated to Isaac. And just to draw your attention again to verse three, God told him for to you and to your descendants, to you, Isaac, the man, and to your descendants, I will give all these lands. Same thing that he told to Abraham. So to Abraham belongs the land of Canaan, to Isaac belongs the land of Canaan and to their descendants belong the land of Canaan. Again, verse five, just draw your attention. 
Abraham, by God's estimation, was obedient. He obeyed God. He kept God's charge, God's commandments, God's statutes, God's laws. Abraham was a holy man. The one who would eventually inherit the land was also holy. What about Jacob? We can see the promise was made to Abraham. The promise was made to Isaac. What about Jacob? Fast forward to Genesis chapter 35. We'll look at verses nine to 12. Starting at verse nine, we see the same thing that we saw with Abraham and Isaac. When he comes and he makes these immense promises, what happens? Verse nine, then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram and he blessed him. God said to him, your name is Jacob. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. Thus he called him Israel. God also said to him, as he said to Abraham, I am God almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you and kings shall come from you. The land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, that is gave to Abraham and Isaac by right, not by actual possession because they didn't possess it, but he gave it to them by right. The land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, verse 12, I will give to you, Jacob, or Israel. And I will give the land to your descendants after you. Do you see? The land is not made to a, just a general group of people, but specific land is made to specific men, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants. By now you should be hearing this and you should be thinking, when? When did that happen? When did that happen? Well, it didn't happen. They actually never got the land in their lifetime. Abraham owned one plot of land that he bought. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 23. And essentially what Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob do with that plot of land is that one field, the only thing that they owned in Canaan when the whole land was promised to them is they turned it into a cemetery and buried the patriarchs there, starting with Sarah. The author of Hebrews rightly understands what's going on in Genesis. You don't have to turn there, but in chapter 11, when he's talking about the faith of the patriarchs, he says in verse 13, Hebrews eleven thirteen, 13, all these, all these saints did or died in faith. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on earth, they did not receive the promises. So they're still waiting still waiting for those promises to be fulfilled. Again, this has tremendous significance for where we're going in Psalm 15. Let's fast forward again to Deuteronomy chapter 12. Deuteronomy chapter 12. Here we are, this is Moses' swan song. He's about to die and pass on the leadership mantle to Joshua and he writes this to the people as he is telling them what not to do in Deuteronomy chapter 12 when they enter into the land. Verse four, you shall not act like this toward Yahweh your God, like the nations act toward their gods. Verse five, but you shall seek Yahweh at the place which Yahweh your God will choose from all your tribes to establish his name there for his dwelling and there you shall come. So we see that they're, they're on the other side of the Jordan 
ready to enter into the land of Canaan that has been promised to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And here we are. The first generation has died, the first generation out of Egypt. And now we're here. This is the moment we've been waiting for. We're going to finally get the land. This is the next step in God's plan for us. And the promise of the land now has something added. It's not just the land of Canaan that's in view, but God mentions a specific place within the land among all the tribes after that land is divided. God's going to choose a specific place now for his name to dwell. That would be by implication where the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant, God's special dwelling place, was. He goes on, verse six, and says, there you shall bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, your contribution, the contribution of your hand, your votive offerings, your freewill offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and of your flock. There also you and your households shall eat before Yahweh your God and rejoice in all your undertakings in which Yahweh your God has blessed you. Jump down to verse 10. When you cross the Jordan and live in the land which Yahweh your God is giving you to inherit. And he gives you rest from all your enemies around you so that you live in in security. Then it shall come about that, here it is again, the place in which Yahweh your God will choose for his name to dwell. There you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithe and and the contribution of your hand and all your choice votive offerings, which you will vow to Yahweh. Again, a specific place within the land now is what's in view. There's a, there's a greater degree of specificity as revelation progresses through Moses. Now, this specific place, by the time Joshua died, was still unknown. Go to Joshua chapter nine. The specific place to Joshua by the time this was written is unknown because at some point after the conquest had taken place in Joshua chapter nine, verse 27, Joshua records this, but Joshua made them, that is the Gibeonites, that day hewers of stone and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of Yahweh. To this day, in the place which he would choose, in the place which he would choose. So Joshua writing this has subjugated the Gibeonites to the people to serve them, but still doesn't know the specific place. Otherwise he would have said it and it wouldn't be referenced as a future tense. He would choose it one day in the future. A couple more passages will get us into the Psalms. Fast forward to 2 Samuel chapter 5. By this time, Israel, the Ark of the Covenant, and the tabernacle have been moved around a little bit within the land, indicating that this particular place is still unknown. In 2 Samuel 5, what we see is David becoming king, and it tells us where David reigned. So chapter 5 of 2 Samuel, verse 5, at Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah. So here we see he's reigning from Jerusalem, and the author even recounts how he obtained that city of Jerusalem. Verse six, now the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites. They were the ones who inhabited Jerusalem at that time. The inhabitants of the land, and they said to David, you shall not come in here, but the blind and lame will turn you away, thinking David cannot enter here. Nevertheless, David captured the stronghold of Zion, apparently an incredible military feat. Nevertheless, David captured the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. 
And so we see uh, Jerusalem and Zion, the, the names have an equation here, the city of Jerusalem, the stronghold of Zion. And it's called furthermore in verse seven, the city of David. This is where David reigned from Zion, from Jerusalem. Uh, in chapter six, recounts how David eventually brought the ark into that city where he reigned. And so David wanted to be near his God. He wanted to be near God's presence. And so he chose for the tabernacle, the tent at the time, to dwell with him in the city of Jerusalem, the city of Zion, the city of David. From this time forward, when David brought the ark into Jerusalem and reigned there as king, Jerusalem, or Zion, holds a unique place in God's plan for the world. Zion, Jerusalem, that city that still exists today, holds a unique place in God's plan for the world. And if you wanna know, what God plans for it. You can read Zechariah 8 when you get an opportunity. Um, that chapter well demonstrates the enduring significance of the city of Jerusalem to God. But now this takes us into the Psalms. Uh, we're in the life of, of David now. Flip over to Psalm 2 and what David says about this coming anointed one. What does God say about his coming king and his relationship to this city? Verse six, but as for me, says Yahweh, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Same term that we find in Psalm 15, holy hill. This is where God has determined to establish his king eventually. Zion holds a permanently significant place in God's kingdom plan. It is the place from which God's anointed one, whom we now know goes by the name Jesus, will one day reign. And what about the, the, because David wrote Psalm 2, what about the end of David's life? Um, You just think about David looking forward, uh, God choosing Jerusalem as the place where his name would dwell. David, all the way on back. Samuel, Moses, Joshua, Moses, Joseph, uh, Jacob, Isaac, Abraham. They were all promised the land. They were promised the land. And yet, again, as the author of Hebrews said, None of them got it. None of them got it. I'm going to take a little bit of extra time and point you to two more passages. If they never got those promises, what must be the implication? What must be the necessary implication if if God is going to be faithful to his word? Since you're in Psalms, go to Psalm 17. Here's what else David is counting on because he knows these promises are still yet coming. Look at Psalm 17, verse 15. What's David counting on? He says in Psalm 17, 15, as for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I will be satisfied with your likeness when I awake. When I awake, that awake is resurrection language indicating that David is counting on being brought back to life after he is asleep, (laughs) a common term in scripture for faithful God-fearing saints who die. They're asleep. David knows he's going to be awakened one day. After death, they will follow a resurrection. And one more uh, passage that's going to just help make this point, go to 1 Kings, 
First Kings chapter one, we see this hope of a resurrection. It's really an assumption of the Old Testament saints that of course this has to take place. Bathsheba believes this because in First Kings one, when David's rebel son Adonijah seeks to take the throne, he sees, okay, dad's about to die and he wants Solomon to be king. And so he tries to take, take the kingdom from David and Solomon before David dies and gives the kingdom to Solomon of his own will. And Nathan and Bathsheba, seeing this coming, seeing the coup developing, they wisely hurry into David at the end of his life and say, okay, David, we gotta make this happen. You said Solomon would get the kingdom. You gotta give it to him. It's not looking good. You gotta pass along the crown. They're going in to a dying man to request that he pass along the crown to Solomon, rightfully so. And listen at verse 29 and following. The king vowed, that is David, and said, as Yahweh lives, who has redeemed my life from all distress, surely as I vowed to you, that is Bathsheba, by Yahweh, the God of Israel, saying, your son Solomon shall be king after me, and he shall sit on my throne in my place. I will indeed do so this day. Her response is astonishing. Verse 31, then Bathsheba bowed with her face to the ground and prostrated herself before the king and said to a dying man, may Yahweh, or excuse me, may my Lord, King David, live forever. Wait, you, you just came to him knowing he was dying and you're desiring him to live forever? Of course. Of course she is. Why? Because she's assuming a resurrection. After David dies, there is life after for David and promises yet to be fulfilled. In particular, the ones that were given to David in 2 Samuel 7 about his seed. But with all of that in mind, there are promises for land to be given to the patriarchs that requires a resurrection Flip back to Psalm 15, because this is the implication of what David is saying when he asks the second question in verse one, who may, abide, who may dwell on your holy hill? Like we said, that is a permanent dwelling and a unique holy place in God's plan. The point is, when David asks this second question, who may dwell on your holy hill, what's he asking? Who has rights to this enduring city when the promises of God are fulfilled? Essentially, we could think of this question as shorthand for who inherits the kingdom when it comes. When God fulfills the promises in this particular place, this holy place to him, who gets rights to that? Who can lay claim to God's kingdom promises? That is the question. And what follows, which brings us to point two, is the necessary answer to that question. And we'll work through these rather quickly. Point two, this is the, the second point in our outline. The answer to that question of who has rightful claim to God's kingdom promises are the characteristics verifying the genuineness of Zion's citizens. The characteristics verifying the genuineness of Zion's citizens. This description is succinct, as is the rest of the psalm, but very thorough. The characteristics of this one who can confidently lay claim to God's coming kingdom is a holy person. Those who dwell on God's holy hill are holy people and only holy people can lay claim with confidence to God's holy hill. 
These characteristics mentioned here are 12 total. They come to us in, in four triplets, so four groups of three, and we'll take each of these groups one at a time. The first triplet, the first group of three is seen in verse two. The characteristics verifying the genuineness of Zion's citizens first are that he is upright, he is just, and he is pious. Upright, just, and pious. Upright, in verse two, he who walks with integrity. That's, that means he's upright. Walk just describes a pattern of life. This man's pattern of life is one of integrity and uprightness. So he lives his life in the same way, whether he's in public or in private, he's the same. It doesn't matter to him who's around because he's the same wherever he goes, the same speech, same convictions, same beliefs, same actions, same everything. He's upright. He has integrity. Can this be said of you, Christian? Are you upright? Zion's citizens are upright. This man is also just the, the second the next characteristic in this first triplet, he is just. That's capturing the phrase and works righteousness or he works justice, he does justice. This describes the pattern of a man's life who acts justly. He seeks to practice just or equitable actions toward others. And we're hearing a lot about justice in our day but it's not defined often in the way that we're hearing it, the way God defines justice. Here, the one who works righteousness or does justice, he has a personal pursuit of doing right towards every man. He gives others what they are owed. He treats people fairly rather than practicing partiality and favoritism. This would necessarily be characterized by an indiscriminate, equal love for all men. Can that be said of you, Christian? Are you just? Zion citizens, those who can confidently lay claim to God's coming kingdom are just people. And then pious. Verse two says, this person speaks truth in his heart. He speaks truth in his heart. That's what I'm calling pious. This isn't a common word, but this means that the man's uprightness of life, it's not a front, it's not fake. This individual speaks the truth in his heart. So where no one else can see the inner self, the, the soul, his spirit, his mind, his innermost being, there, this person cares about truth. He cares about speaking truth, not with his lips, but in his heart. This is what we call at Grace Bible Church, heart shepherding, shepherd your heart. That's what he's doing. He's imparting truth on the heart level so that his thoughts, his actions, his desires, his feelings, his motivations, his choices, because he speaks the truth there, because he shepherds his heart with God's truth, all of those aspects of his person and his life conform to what God has said. Can this be said of you? Do you speak the truth in your heart? Do you care about truth there? Zion citizens are pious people. The next characteristic seen in the second set of three, these are preceded by negatives. So what this man is not three times, he is also not slanderous. He's not slanderous. Verse three says he does not slander with his tongue. Slander was expressly forbidden in Mosaic law. Leviticus 19.6 says, you shall not go about as a slanderer among your people and you are not to act against the life of your neighbor. I am Yahweh. This word translated slander, it apparently shares its origin with a word that means to walk around as a spy to walk around as a spy is what a slanderer is. That means that this forbidden practice, what's being forbidden is this practice of watching and listening like a spy 
in various people's affairs in order to go back and give a report to others. That's slander. Usually these reports uh, are gossip that's, that fails by not being the full story or being an inaccurate story, uh, having inaccurate details is what makes it slander. And so the righteous man doesn't do this is the point. Uh, you wanna look around the world and know who are those who believe God, who fear God, who inherit the kingdom, the land promised to Abraham when Jesus finally brings the kingdom? Well, not a slanderer. And so can this be said of us? Can this be said of you, Christian? Are you a slanderer? Zion citizens, those who inherit Zion are not slanderers. And so we should labor to not be slanderers since we know this. The next characteristic, he's not treacherous. That is, nor does evil to his neighbor, verse three. Nor does evil to his neighbor. This person also does not willingly participate in doing evil to other people. This man can be relied on to do good and he doesn't betray the trust of those who rely on him. He's not treacherous with people who depend on him. Can this be said of you? Are you treacherous? Zion's citizens are not treacherous. Nor are they malicious, which is the next quality. Nor takes up a reproach, verse three says, against his friend. Nor takes up a reproach against his friend. Somewhat difficult to uh, translate, interpret. But essentially what this is, is getting at is he doesn't bear malice towards others. He doesn't take an offense and as the NASB says, uh, take it up, right? He doesn't raise up this shameful thing that was done and carry it around with him so that his attitude and actions toward that person are one of malice at, as if he's been offended. This is not a practice of Christians. Uh, those who inherit God's kingdom are forgiving people. Those who are forgiven do forgive. Is anyone able to accuse us of malice, Christian? This shouldn't be the case. Is there anyone against whom you've taken up a reproach? Someone you've been unwilling to forgive? Someone you've been delaying to seek forgiveness from? or extend forgiveness to? These are not things that ought to be said of kingdom citizens. The third triplet seen in verse four, three more things now going from what we saw were positive characteristics to the negative characteristics, what he's not. Now David, as a skillful poet goes back in the third triplet to a set of positives. Positively, what is this one who inherits the promises? What is he characterized by? Verse four, in whose eyes a reprobate is despised. This person despises reprobates. To despise reprobates uh, or a reprobate, literally, literally one who is despised, he despises one who is despised. It's not to say that he has uh, hatred in his heart toward anyone. That would actually contradict what he just mentioned about not having malice. But rather this means that the man shares the disposition toward others that God himself possesses toward those men. He sees people the way God sees them. So if God determines that someone is despised, is a reprobate by his estimation, then the righteous man agrees with God and he doesn't give preference to men of rank, to men of wealth or status. He just agrees with what God has said. He doesn't admire people whom God despises. And the next quality is actually similar to this one in that the converse is true. Not only does he despise reprobates, people who, whom God is deemed despised, but people who honor God, he honors them. 
Verse four says, but he honors those who fear Yahweh. So he does admire these people. He does rightly esteem them. The people that God esteems, he gets on God's agenda and esteems them. Can this be said of you? Do you agree with God when he tells us how to think about each person? Do you despise, not esteem those whom God doesn't esteem? Do you esteem and honor those whom God does esteem and honor? Zion's citizens are characterized by this. And he also fills, fulfills his commitment, which is, brings us to the end of the third triplet. He fulfills his commitment. In our day, a man's word means next to nothing. We have contracts to ensure you keep your word. And in those con contracts, we give you a way to not keep your word. Almost everything in our day is negotiable from things you purchase like a house. If you, if you commit to paying so much for a house, you can short sell it. People who swear before God to remain married for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer in sickness and in health can get a no fault divorce. And apparently you can even unadopt a child that you've adopted. And Christians, so-called, are practicing this. Adopting a child, and because parenting isn't all that I've dreamed, because it's difficult, I can unadopt my child and give them back to the state. That is wicked. That is wicked. Which is why David is able to say he swears to his own hurt, verse four. This is, he fulfills his commitments even when it doesn't benefit him. He agrees to pay for something. If it's gonna impoverish him, he pays it anyway. He gets into a marriage that turns out not to be in his favor. A man living with a difficult wife, a woman living with a difficult husband. What do kingdom citizens do? They stay married even though that's incredibly difficult. Why? Not because I'm trying to earn something from God, not because I'm trying to prove how tough I am or anything like that, but because that's right. That's the right thing to do. To swear to one's own hurt demonstrates that you value truthfulness and faithfulness, which find their source in God. This ought to be said of us because this is true of those who inherit the kingdom. This brings us to our final triplet, which David transitions again like he did in the second triplet back to negative characteristics. Here you have all three. No, he's not fickle. He's not greedy. He's not bribable. He's not fickle. He's not greedy. He's not bribable. Not fickle. At the end of verse four, he does not change. He does not change. The person who does not change, who's not fickle, I'm one person one day and a different person another day, depending on who's around, I, I differ and change. That person who doesn't do that must then live by conviction, not by emotion, or by practical expediency. What's going to profit me in the moment? This person must do what was mentioned in verse one and be speaking the truth in his heart so that he doesn't change wherever he goes. Can this be said of you? Are you blown about by every wind of doctrine? Zion citizens are not fickle people. Also, they're not greedy, which is what verse five is about. He does not put out his money at interest, putting out money to other Israelites at interest was forbidden in Mosaic law, Exodus 22, 25, you can write that, that down. It says, if you lend money to my people, to the poor among you, you are not to act as a creditor to him. You shall not charge him interest. And so because the Jews were a special people to God, they were prohibited from taking advantage of their brother's misfortune. So that if one person became poor, either by God's providence or by his own foolishness, they were not, they were to be generous 
with one another and give rather than be greedy and self-serving. And I'm so thankful that that is the testimony of so many of you at Grace Bible Church. We have incredibly generous people in our church, people that will let you stay in their homes for a month. People who have sacrificially given to the formal needs of the church body, people who give in secret and anonymously and in informal ways when the need arises, thank you for being generous people. It is an indication that you, having believed God and who are living in keeping with what he commands with being generous, can confidently lay claim to the promises that are coming. And then finally, he's not bribable. Zion citizens are not bribable. Bribery was another practice explicitly prohibited by the law. Exodus 23, eight condemns it because it blinds the, the clear sighted and subverts the cause of the just. So people who will inherit the kingdom are those who value truth more than wealth and they cannot be bought. Can you be bought is a good question to ask. When things seem to profit you, do you change your mind and waver on your convictions? Or again, do you swear to your own hurt? He does not take a bribe against the innocent. If these things are true of you, if these things are true of you, then you have an amazing guarantee from God that concludes this song. At the end of verse five, we don't get another description of the one who inherits these promises, this kingdom to come. But what we get in that last line is a promise. And that's point number three, the guarantee securing the fearlessness of Zion citizens the guarantee securing the fearlessness of Zion citizens. This promise by God given to Zion citizens, people whose lives look like verses two to five, this would instill and should instill tremendous confidence. If you see God's grace manifested in these ways in your life, then you should have tremendous confidence that you have been saved by God because the fruit of salvation are evident in your life. And the promises to come, the promises that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses, and David are still waiting for belong to you. He who does these things will never be shaken. Or literally in the Hebrew, the promises, the guarantee is, he who does these things, who practice these things, will not be shaken unto forever. So not only promise for this life, but for the life to come, will not be shaken, will not be moved. In this life, you have God's enduring blessing. You will not be shaken. And how long does that not being shaken last? The Hebrew text tells us all the way into forever, the everlasting kingdom with no end that belongs to David's descendants. As I close, and I know I've gone long, thank you so much for, uh, for bearing with me. First, second Peter, excuse me, second Peter. Peter articulates this very same concept in Psalm 15 so well. Peter says this, how do you know the apostles were believing David? Because he articulates the same truth for a New Testament audience in second Peter chapter one starting at verse five. Now for this very reason, because God has made you partakers in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust, verse five, for this very reason also applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. Why? For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, if you're diligent to increase and pursue these things, these 
characteristics of godliness. They render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, for he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing of you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. You will never be shaken. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Do you see? Psalm 15, just as what Peter articulates, is intended to promote sincere, persevering worship in those who hear. And I can think of no better way to further solidify these truths, to further promote that sincere, persevering worship in us than by singing together Psalm 15. Let's sing together Psalm 15.